Hello, everybody. So we have a few people. Maybe we should wait a few more minutes for more attendees to join us. And while we do that, I'm going to take one second, be right back. Here we go. I tell you what, guys, I absolutely love having four 32 inch monitors. But when it comes down to it, I have not yet mastered how to get everything I want where I want it. We've got three o'clock, but we should probably wait a few more minutes to see if a few, anybody else is going to join before we start. I, I would concur. Although, um, we, we, might, we might have a pretty light turnout today with uh, a lot of people maybe out on vacation this week, but yeah, there's a, quite a few people out. There's only like four people in the office here out of 15. So for those who haven't heard already, I guess we should just throw it out there that two weeks from now on Tuesday, the 14th, at the same time, um, Brett Clark from NearMap and his team are going to make a presentation about uh, real-time uh, imagery collection. So we're going to get it. Another one, and Sean's awesome presentation from a month ago is recorded and available on our YouTube site for Magic Memphis. And if you haven't seen it, <clears throat> it was pretty awesome. So go watch it. Well, look, y'all, if we have a light turnout today, I don't see why we can't just open up, uh, open up the... Uh, I guess anybody can go in and chime in at any time. We can actually have some kind of collaborative conversation going on about the material. There's 10 times more material than I could actually cover today in the presentation, but I wanted it to be in there so that people could go back and reference some of these key terms. Okay, I've, I've gone ahead and allowed all participants to unmute themselves. So anybody that's here in the meeting now should be able to, un, you should be able to click on the mute button on the lower left corner of your screen if you want to contribute to the conversation. Awesome, thank you. Oh, it's Rick Weary, he's here. Tony's here. So I've got 302. Let's uh let's give it to 305 and then we'll go ahead and get rolling. Does that sound good? Sounds like a plan. Sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. So Scott, what I would say is 
roll with your presentation if you want to, or we could do a collaborative discussion, but we can record it and it'll be archived. So that's kind right. of a win-win. And we can revisit it later because it's going to keep changing and adopting and evolving. Yes. Great, great to see you, Rick. Or hear you, or know you're there somewhere. Trying to, trying to unmute. They just have to find the, the button. So, Somewhere in the ethos. I always had like 10 more people join. Awesome. For those of you that just joined, we're about to, we're going to start the presentation right about 3.05, just to make sure um, I don't leave anybody out. Everybody needs to turn their camera on and we can have like Hollywood squares. You don't want to see this. <laughs> oh, he was right. Hey, <laughs> what'd I say? Kevin Bingham online. What's up, Kevin? Mr. Bingham? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Hello, Kevin. So is that Scott masking up for the for the meeting? <laughs> and just, just for uh, confidentiality's sake, this is being recorded. I don't have a camera hooked up myself. Just, just saying. It is it's being recorded because we, we we took we took Sean's presentation and put that on um, on YouTube, and it's fifty three minutes of a rub a dub hub. Okay, I've got three oh five. Um, so we might have a few more people join, but uh, let's go ahead and get started so we don't get keep people waiting around and. Um, we don't want this to take uh, the rest of the afternoon. Um, so, uh, I'm going to bring it home, guys. I'm going to take y'all all the way to 5 o'clock. I hope you're holding on to your chairs. And since you're at home, I guess you can pregame. I can't, so I'll stick with my coffee. Um, so today, really, I just kind of wanted to come in, and since there's such few of us on here, if y'all have a question, by all means, don't hesitate to unmute yourself and uh, just ask a question because really it's all about collaboration because every time I talk about Next Generation 911, I, I learn a new tidbit of information that helps me and sometimes, you know, it helps me share how we're doing. So, um, so Next Gen 911 Collaboration, Cooperation, and Collection. I don't know if any of you actually heard the, the talk that I gave at uh, the Magic Conference last year, but this was kind of the key. But since then, it has kind of moved forward and we've done a few new things here in the state of Mississippi, as well as some of the stuff that's going on nationwide with the, the coronavirus. A lot of these, these grants that were pushed out have now been, uh, there we go, have now been uh, extended. So, um, Captain Scott Trappolino, if you can't see, that's my fire truck behind me. That really is my fire truck for my fire station. But um, I am coming in and we're just going to discuss today just a few things. And look, there's a lot of key terminology here that I'm going to briefly touch on. If you have ever done 911 or worked with a 911 system, you're going to be familiar with these terms. But if not, take this. Uh, take these terms and they're going to be interused. They're going to be intertwined with if you're ever wanting to work with dispatchers or a 911 or first responders, it'll help you kind of break down those barriers of communication, just knowing what they're talking about. Um, so terminology, we're going to talk a little bit about how next gen 911 is affecting the local GIS professionals and then how GIS data, data validation and GIS standards are going to be key. It's, it's almost like, to be completely honest with you, it's like a perfect world. You know, if, if everything was perfect in our GIS systems, there would be no gaps. There would be no 
overlaps. Um, all the data would be seamless, perfect. And that's kind of what a next gen 911 system is. So let's go. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about field data collection and methodology, um, kind of tell you a little bit what we did, what we've done in Mississippi and how that's moving forward right now. And then um, I would invite any of y'all, uh, we're going to actually have a next generation 911 uh, collaboration meeting in North Mississippi, but Tennessee folks are welcome as well uh, to come down and just kind of talk about how the, the system affects GIS professionals and first responders. And Data Mark is actually going to come in and work on that. We had it scheduled until COVID came in, and now that the we're doing the social distancing. It's it's been pushed back. Let's go ahead. So um, I don't know how many of y'all know, but the National Telecommunication and Information Administration pushed out a grant to help all of the states, um, all of the states that actually applied for it, move towards next generation, next generation nine one one. So if you don't know, the state of Tennessee received three three million dollars, and I believe that they had to, these are matching funds. Um, Mississippi received 1.9 to and this is this is to help you build your next gen 911 system not only at the local level some of the states are actually disseminating these funds at the local level and giving them out for data collection um, for data processing and validation as well as to build your uh, what they call an ESI net which is the actual uh, location network so here's Mississippi uh, at 2019. This is how many counties we actually had with um, point addresses. If you notice, we have so 67 out of 116 PSAPs and 37 out of 82 counties. Since uh, this map was published, I guess in November 2019, we now have Scott County, or we now have Smith County, Covington County, and uh, what was the other county that we're working on right now? I believe Benton County now has point addresses. And I think that's it for right now. So we're slowly but surely filling the gap in Mississippi. Um, next gen 911 definition. I hate reading slides, but this is probably the best way to explain this one is a system comprised of emergency service IP networks. They're called ESI nets. Remember that word because that's actually, it's a location based um, network that allows the uh, 911 systems to work. And I'm gonna show you a diagram here in a second. Um, let's go ahead and look, like I said but initially, if anybody came in late, the, um, all of this stuff's gonna be put on the web. So I'm gonna skip through a lot of this terminology. So it's not that I don't wanna explain it, but we won't get enough time to finish everything up. So here's your next gen 911 environment. And I did steal this from Michael Baker with their permission. Um, but so in a next gen environment, you can text with your phone, you can call with your mobile phone, you can call with a landline, you can use a uh, voice over IP, uh, your computer, all of this gets fed into what they call an ESI net, which is, I'm about to go over these acronyms for you right here. Um, and all of this feeds into a GIS network where your call is, based on your spatial location, which in my eyes, super cool, super cool to have that. Cause I don't know if many of you know now, but if you don't have next gen 911, you're normally phase one or phase two compliant. And it's simply based, depending on who your CAD vendor or your 911 vendor is, it's based off of data built within a street center line. If your address comes within a certain range, then you get this, fire department or emergency service to respond to you. So this is where GIS really comes into play with next gen 911. So PSAP y'all, public safety answering point. An MSAG, I'll show you what an example of an MSAG looks like if you haven't seen one before, but it's essentially a database of street names and it's this is kind of like the legacy um, 911. It's 911 is for, for your, when it was built for your landline phone, they had what they called an MSAG. And this MSAG essentially has they, uh, the street, the range of the street, the high and low address range, and then who's supposed to respond. 
Um, CAD is not the CAD that us GIS professionals look at. It's a computer aided dispatch. So it's a computer system based off of the PSAP information feeded, getting fed with the MSAG and the alley. So um, automated location identification. So that's your, your alley is the data, the supplemental data that is backed up by your uh, MSAG. Let's go on here. So this is what an MSAG looks like, y'all. If you've never seen one, it's a really, really simple. Um, and this MSAG looks the same in Denver, Colorado, as it looks in Mississippi. It's essentially the same thing. If you notice, you got your ESN, your um, ID 911, you've got your exchange, as well as your high and low address range and your street name. It's funny that I just used this because I just updated their 911 system this morning in Tippa County. All right, so back to terminology, EziNet. EziNet is a managed IP network. Imagine an IP network that is, or a GIS network that's seamless throughout your entire state, but not, not just your state, throughout the entire nation, where there is not a square inch on the ground that you can't touch in a dispatch map and it not tell you exactly who's supposed to respond and how they're supposed to respond to certain incidences for 911. Um, the ECRF is the emergency call routing function. It's a function within the EZNet that allows your location to service translation protocol server to find out exactly where you are if you're calling from a cell phone or if you're using uh, text. Um, then you've got your location validation function, which is another function within your um, loss protocol. Your terminology here is, uh, I'm certain some of you, if you work for local government, you've heard an ESN which is emergency service number. Um, an ESZ is an emergency service zone, and an ESB is an emergency service boundary. So you've got your ESN is just the number and the location. And if you look here, you've got your law enforcement ESB. This kind of gives you a good explanation. Like, So your emergency service boundary is specific to your law, fire, and EMS. Your ESN is the area that encompasses all three of these and your emergency service boundary is the entire boundary around all uh, responses. So, and when I was, <laughs> something that Rob and I actually had to go through just recently, I thought, you know, when I came in for 911, next gen 911 really wasn't pushed. I guess this was about 2010, 2011. I said, man, wouldn't it be cool if you could click anywhere on the map and it would tell you who's supposed to respond from fire, EMS, and police? So we built them all into one layer, emergency response boundary, and you can click anywhere on the map and it would tell you uh, the run area, what engine, tanker, rescue, EMS, EMR, squad, and it's built all the way out for every single fire department within the entire county, including all of the PSAPs, because we have five peeps, PSAPs in DeSoto County. But lo and behold, when NextGen finally did roll around and we started implementing, we realized that, whoa, 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 you can't do that. The layers all have to be separate. Um, so required data layers for, your, uh, for the ECRF and the uh, LVF to function are your road center lines, your point addresses, your PSAP boundary, your emergency service boundary, which must include law, fire, and emergency medical, and they all have to be separate layers, um, and a provisioning boundary, which is the boundary of your entire PSAP area. Um, so strongly recommended. These are some other layers that are strongly recommended to uh, aid in NextGen 911. It's an alias table, a landmark table, um, and then all adjacent incorporated and unincorporated boundaries to make sure that none of them overlap. I remember when we were doing Next Gen 911, or when uh, Shelby County was doing Next Gen 911, uh, Carlton called me and uh, Tim called me and said, Hey, Scott, I need you to send me all the data from DeSoto County because we have to match. There can't be any gaps, slivers, or overlaps. And so I sent them everything so that we can compare and then trade up data. So here is kind of where we are at the state right now. It's actually. Um, this should have been approved in May. The only problem is um, nobody's meeting right now. If you notice, we're all on virtual environment. So this is kind of sitting at the house level right now and the state, 
but we're pretty sure that it's going to be picked up um, sooner than later. And if anybody wants a copy of it, so let me go ahead and tell you how this worked. I actually grabbed the state of Mississippi. We created it from the state of Oklahoma, the state of Arkansas, Kansas. It was Arkansas, Kansas, Tennessee, Oklahoma, and one other state. We took all of theirs. We picked what we wanted out of it, made sure that it met the minimum requirements requirements for uh, Nina and put it out there. So these are some of the spatial components. Everybody knows here what a point line and polygon is. Um, but these are some of the issues that you run into with the next gen 911. It doesn't like the alphanumeric. So 3030B, um, and this is funny, 3030 is across the street. I actually showed this to somebody and uh, didn't realize that these two addresses, somebody just put a trailer in there, never contacted 911 and, and called it called a B. Um, but here is some of the stuff and I would be more than willing to share all of our, anything that we've put together. So if you have any information or need any information after this, don't hesitate to contact me or reach out. I'm not going to go over all these. Um, this was something that we just recently updated our place, our place types. We added a whole bunch of place types that might be local to Mississippi, such as a cotton gin or a, um, a grain bin. We have a lot of agriculture here. So, I mean, these things are tweaked and customized by, by every, uh, every state to meet their needs and every area. So let's keep going here. And I just wanted y'all to be able to have all that. So data validation is a huge, huge thing. Um, GIS, MSAG and Alley, data format, what is topology? Um, and the funny thing is DeSoto County just had their, just had our uh, 911 system put together and we asked them about if they ran topology and no topology ran from our, for our new 911 system. We found slivers and gaps. So we're slowly but surely fixing them and, and coming in there and doing it manually. But, um, I don't know if any of y'all use this, but Geocom, 911 Data Masters, Data Mart, they have really, really cool tools that are out there. There's a whole bunch of tools out there that are um, that also are um, open source. And uh, you can send me an email or whatever. I can send you that information. But what they do is they take your GIS data, your MSAG data, and your Alley data from your legacy database. They merge them all together, and they verify that the MSAG meet matches the Alley, which matches the GIS. And uh, they also look at different topology rules and then they'll split you, spit you out a report or I'll show you where the errors are. Just like running topology in your GIS data, it runs topology on all the tabular data and the GIS data at the same time, which is cool. Um, so here to talk a little bit about what we've done uh, with Mississippi with our, our uh, Mississippi 811 had an idea a couple of years ago, and I know a few of you that are on the call have heard this before, but they had an idea about teaming up with um, individuals throughout the entire state because they had electric power data, and they took that data and converted the meters into address points, and that's how we were doing our field verification um, for our point addresses, especially in rural Mississippi, which has actually turned out to be 80 to 90% accurate in most, in most cases because they know where to send the bill. Um, we did a pilot study. We've done, um, we found out that if you want to do a study like this, or if you want to do some work and collect data, it's better to get a representative from the city or county to work with you so that they're vested in the process. And, um, just to give you a side note, we just finished up. Um, we just finished up. Uh, Canopy Spatial worked with. Uh, we're working. We're still working with Grapevine, Texas, right now, and helping them. And their GIS manager. After we got done, we got all their data. We field verified it. And after we got done, the last day of riding every road in her city, she looked at me and she's like, "Every GIS manager." Every GIS professional that works for a local government or a county should have to ride every road. She said she had never ridden every road. She didn't know where some of the developments were going on and how far they were. 
And because a lot of times we as GIS professionals get stuck in the office behind, you know, all these big monitors and we're processing the data, but we don't actually get out there and, and experience the issues and the problems that not just the citizens are having, but maybe public works, uh, road department. So with, uh, I thought that was really neat. So pass that on to y'all. Um, so field data collection, uh, we started out with paper, then we went to geo PDFs. I know some of y'all have heard my Avenza PDF, we went to GIS collector, and now we're using carry map to go out and actually uh, collect all of the data because most of the places we go are very disconnected. So our, um, so Mississippi 811 is working with local GIS professionals to assist adjacent counties and cities to collect um, data, but we're not just doing that. We're teaching, um, we're teaching them how to take that data and process it and then update it. So I got a really, really cool thing I can tell y'all this, this week. I got a call from Mississippi 811 and they said that uh, one of the counties that I had assisted within the last year sent them an update. They didn't call me to help them send an update. I, we actually ran through some some classes with them, taught them how to do it. They bought into the software and now they're updating and maintaining their own data. And I haven't heard from them in probably almost three months and they're sending in updates to 811. So we now know it's working. Um, so coming together right here, I had a friend that we had all those puzzle pieces out in a previous presentation. He's like, well, how come the puzzle pieces aren't coming together? Um, the state of Mississippi now has a 911 authority and it's based in um, the Mississippi Emergency Management Agency, which is not necessarily what we wanted, but they are there. And um, addressing has become put on the forefront for the state of Mississippi, not only for next gen 911, but for census and uh, other things that they're doing at the state level, especially cleaning up the voter rolls and so forth. Oh, so key collaborators, how, how are we working with the locals and assisting the state? So the state doesn't have all the resources to push forward next gen 911. They had just a small amount of money. So what we're doing right now is we're taking the GIS professionals, the 911 coordinators, the emergency managers, Mississippi 811, local elected officials, and the GIS coordinating council for the state. And what we've done is we've come up with a statewide next gen 911 needs assessment. So I'm gonna kind of go through this real quick with you. Um, and just, it's, a, it's we created a questionnaire to go out to all of our PSAPs, but it also assists all of the GIS professionals in the state. Because a lot of times I was really surprised to know that you had a GIS professional located at a county or a city and they didn't know that 911 actually had data that they needed to uh, do their, you know, they didn't think they had point addresses and they actually had point addresses. Um, so how many full-time dispatchers, part-time dispatchers? I'm not gonna read through all of these. Some of these y'all can read through, but these are some of the questions um, that you will, you know, need to ask to be able to find out how next gen 911 ready you are as a, as a local entity as well as a state entity. So, you know, who's your communication provider? Um, does your PSEP have the capability to receive text to 911 now? Um, hardware, list the number of dispatch consoles, both active and inactive and what operating systems. You would be surprised. I've walked into dispatch systems that are still running XP and this was in the, within the last year. Um, what's your CAD provider so that maybe you could reach out to them and find out what data they already have available um, so you're not starting from scratch. Is your CAD provider next gen 911 ready? Um, then what GIS data do they have? Do you have center lines, point addresses, ESN boundaries? We actually went to a county not too long ago and asked them, you know, they said, oh yeah, we've got point address data and street center line data. And we went and sat down with them. And what we realized was they had Google Earth or Google, they had Google Maps in their dispatch. And all they had, they were told that they had all this information, but all they were running off of was the MSAG. So the CAD vendor had kind of 
pulled a fast one over them and they just didn't know. They didn't know what a street center line was, what a point address was, and how it played a role in Next Generation 911. So that's a lot of times is sharing this information with as many GIS professionals as I can, as well as first responders and dispatchers, because I want to break down those lines of communication and collaboration. So let's see, training and education. This is huge. I mean, y'all already know that we're GIS professionals. We're, we're training every day to learn the newest technology and to do to do things as functional as possible with the least amount of work, right? So uh, we are gonna have a Mississippi Education and Training Next Gen work Workshop that's gonna be put on by uh, Datamark. And you should be able to bring your data, a copy of your information if you wanted to, to run it, if you work for a city, or if you just wanna come and sit in and listen to what they have to say, they put on Datamark puts on a heck of a presentation and class. I've attended several of their workshops. Um, so by all means, come and hear what they have to say. Their tool is probably one of the coolest ones I've seen on the market as far as validating your data, especially when you're looking at, so the city of Grapevine right now, and you, you might have this same instance, the city of Grapevine, the addressing is done in one department and then the addressing gets transferred to three other departments without getting verified. And sometimes they don't necessarily get that information as it comes in. So, and it doesn't, it, it, it and the funny thing is, is it hardly ever makes it to the end, which is at the, the 911 system. So we're trying to help them streamline a way for them to not only, because they don't have heavy end GIS users issuing the addresses, but they need to know if those addresses meet the next gen standards, which fall back on your MSAG and your alley, as well as your street center line data. So does anybody have any questions? I kind of went through that really, really fast. Hopefully it was a lot of information in a short amount of time. Um, really just kind of wanted to open up the conversation for anybody that, that might want to, uh, talk about next gen 911, maybe some issues you've been having. I might have run into the same issues. We can share that information and collaborate back and forth. Yeah, Scott, this is Rick Weary. Uh, you mentioned some uh, uh, third party source or, or um, <clears throat> uh, what was it, open source tools mm -hmm. that you used. Do you want to go over any of those that you uh, used to, to um, pull the data together? I don't have any on my computer right now to demo, and I wish I did. Um, there's a gentleman named Bo Quos out of uh, Arizona who put together an awesome tool. So if you want his information, or I can even share where you can download his tool, um, because most of these tools aren't cheap. I can tell you right now, I mean, the, the Geocom tool to do the validation and checks on your 911 system, I want to say it's like six or seven grand. And then, and that's a, a year. And then you've got uh, data marks tool is not inexpensive. I haven't found anybody that's saying, oh yeah, I've got a $500 tool out there that will do everything you need. Now the open source data won't do everything that the other tools will, but it's, it's probably 85, 90% close. Yeah. So you're, you're tightening up the data and getting it uh, within reason. And then you're, you've got a short run on some other tools or some manual uh, edits after that. Yeah, and most of the tools you're going to run are, so say you have a legacy 911 system where all of your data, all of your data is stored in a format that has to be in that format, but your state comes in and adopts a completely different schema. You, most of these tools assist in migrating that. Now you can write a script to do it yourself, but these tools kind of automate that, whereas you know, your, your state wants it to be you know, num underscore house, whereas yours is house underscore num, you know, for the house number, depending on what it is. And it'll actually take all that data and convert it for you with the push of a button. You just have to set it up on the front end with the, the open source tool. And it's, it's pretty neat. So, so the open source tools you're using, is that going with um, 
QGIS or is it uh, is it running within the ArcGIS? No, it, actually runs, it actually runs with an Arc map. Um, okay. Right. Uh, I don't want to misquote this. Just holler at me. I'll have to find it. I'll dig through. Okay. Yeah, if you got information on that, I'm interested. So. Okay, cool. Hey, Scott, it's Sean. I got a question for you. Yeah. What about uh, address verification with some of the agencies that you're working for? And what I'm talking about is, you know, we've, we call them address vigilantes, yes. where some people will assign their own addresses. Uh, they're out of sequence. They're odd on the even side. Uh, can you share some experiences? Are, are you involved in getting the addresses corrected? Uh, how much flack are you getting? What, what kind of, what situation is happening with all this? Let me go ahead. I'm so glad you said that. So right before I pulled this up, I'm not going to read this email, but I'll pull the map up and show it to you. Um, I'll pull it. Let's open it up and drag it over here. So can y'all see that? So look, this just happened. I mean, yesterday afternoon. So the yellow addresses are what were what was issued. This subdivision was platted in like 2006, and evidently there wasn't a GIS person here at the time. So the planner just threw some numbers on there, but they didn't realize they threw the numbers on there backwards. So instead of 10880 right here, 10880 should be all the way over here. And then, so the red numbers are the numbers that actually what should be. And then, so if you look at like, like 10904 and see where 10903 is, they should be across from each other, but they're not. So nobody in my office wants to touch this. Like I brought it to the planner, I brought it to the building official. And so you know what they did? They said, pass it on to who? The 911 coordinator. Mm -hmm. So I sent the 911 coordinator an email that just says it's come to my attention. These addresses are out of sequence. What would you like to do? Essentially, so in the county, Rob and I found out it's political suicide when I worked with Rob in the county to ask somebody to change their address, especially if they've had it for the last five, six years. Um, or much less more than that. I think we asked somebody to change their address they had had for 25 years. But mm -hmm. As you can see, it's out of sequence. So you tell me, how would you fix this? I actually had several people say, well, just address it backwards, but then you can't even address it backwards because this number right here is going to mess up with this number right here. One way or the other, somebody's address is going to change. So I'm flipping on a coin to see which one will be the less aggressive person and go with that. My opinion was make them all change it because you don't own your address. Hey, exactly. That's, hey. that's my policy here in Tipton County. Uh, you don't own that address. Uh, it, it can get emotional and, <laughs> and residents do get defensive. And I also meant to point out that the address vigilantes are not just the residents, but like you, you just said, the planning and uh, some other agency had, had jacked things up. Uh, and it's amazing how that, that can happen uh, rather, rather easily. And uh, we, we have received threats and, you know, you can't tell me what to do or what's wrong with my address. Why are you bothering me? So I, I can understand, uh, I can understand your approach and, and the problem. Hey, Sean, well, uh, let me just add a, a couple of things to what Scott was saying about this. Um, one is um, just as far as a, a good procedure for, um, reassigning addresses that we've found to be effective in DeSoto County was we, we've established a really good working relationship with the county E911 director and so any notifications of address change go out on E911 letterhead from the E911 director's office uh, and it doesn't give me any choice it basically says this is your new address your address has been changed from such and such to such and such 
you have, and I think they, I, I can't remember the exact specifics, but it says we have something like 90 days or six months, whatever the post office requires as far as, uh, you know, however long they will forward mail because, you know, uh, one thing that's going to have to happen is the homeowner is going to have to get all their mail forwarded to the new address. The other thing I want to point out that I had, that Scott and I hadn't really considered when we were having the E911 director notify people that their addresses are changed is that just because we change their address doesn't mean that the utility companies that provide electricity and so on and so forth are going to change the address in their system. And so the homeowners that have had their addresses changed by the 911 director uh, via collaboration with GIS, now they really actually have two addresses. They have the address, it's their 911 address that they're getting mail at, and then they still have the original address that the utility company insists is really their address because the utility company didn't recognize the address change. So it gets to be a real headache, actually. Um, uh, so I just want to throw that out there. Um, I, I, the longer I've been here, the more I advise against changing addresses unless it's absolutely necessary. So what would you do with that, Rob? <laughs> Look at the screen and tell me how to fix that. I would, uh, you know, I see three houses there. I don't know if there are actually more houses that have, have been built well, since that photo was taken. I wrote out there, so the hash marks, the yellow hash marks are houses that are under construction right now. So you can change those, no problem. It's the others you got to worry about. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, you know. I mean, go for it. I mean, if you've only got one, two, three, four, five, six constructions out of how many there? Well, no, there's there's three houses being built and there's three houses already existing. So six All out of- All we have to change are the three existing house numbers and be done with it. So there you go. Well, yeah, it's easy. It's said than done, but they don't, they, I was told, mm -mm. not on my watch. Well- what if they want emergency services at their address? Uh, if they have the wrong address, how do how do we? If we nine one one has something, how do they know what address to go to? If, if they well, don't have their own address, I tried to tell them if I turn off of this road as a firefighter and turn down this road, I'm expecting the addresses to go down, not go up. Yeah, but I know. Oh yeah. Hey, you know, the struggle is real <laughs> when it comes to people's addresses. It can be. Thank you. Well, does anybody else have anything um, or do they have just anything we want to talk about? It's kind of like the magic hour. Do we need to have a magic happy hour, y'all, where we do like Hollywood Squares and we have questions and trivia? Would y'all be interested in something like that? As long as we're uh, six feet apart. <laughs> and also addresses just need to go away. We need to go with what three words that they map the entire country and that's the whole nation. So let's go with what three words. Yeah, blue, green, dog. <laughs> Right. Hey, Scott, like, Scott, I'm, I'm, I'm calling from white, black, red. <laughs> Scott, we have POB. Do you know POB point of beginning the surveyors? They did surveyor says on Zoom the other day. It was kind of fun to watch. It was funny. Oh, I bet that was good. Like a game show. Surveyor says it was cute. <laughs> hey, Scott, you want to bring up? Um, what about the the post office um, extravaganza about um, aren't they aren't they pushing or, or isn't it in law or, or about um, creating mailboxes centralized mailboxes for like subdivisions so that the houses started, don't have individual addresses and stuff like that that started three years ago it was initiated by the U.S. Postal Service three years ago it's just now reaching us here in Tennessee and. Uh, Mississippi, but yeah, any new developments and even existing developments, they're looking at potentially putting what they call 
aren't they called collection boxes, Rob? Or uh, something like that. Here we, they call them, they're calling them cluster boxes, but cluster boxes, that's it. But yeah, no, our supervisors tried to fight it in DeSoto County. And what we did was I called all the way to Jackson. I went as high as I could in the post office. And the, the postmaster pretty much told me, you do realize that we're going to tell you what you're going to do to get your mail. And the supervisors still tried to fight it. But guess what? We got cluster boxes in Mississippi now. I should point out that actually brings more complications because when you have cluster boxes at the front entrance to the subdivision, then you don't have mailboxes in front of the houses. So yes. emergency responders uh, need to look all the way to the actual house to maybe find the number of the house. You know, and I, I'm sure the planning departments are requiring the numbers to be posted on the house, but of course that's a lot harder to see from the road, especially at night, than a mailbox is. And, um, you know, once trees start growing up in the front yard, it's very possible the, there's a lot of houses that emergency responders are going to have a very difficult time finding because their numbers are not marked clearly. I'm not sure how we deal with that, but I bet Scott's got a better insight on that. No, it's just uh, really we, we talked about that. I've actually talked about that with several other people from other states because like Texas is already really big into it. If you drive around in areas that are like that, you'll notice, especially curb and gutter areas, you'll notice that on the curb, they will put the number and then they will also have the number on the house. That's great for curb and gutter, but 90% of subdivisions in, outside of the municipalities in DeSoto County are not curb and gutter, they're open ditch. And then you, what are we gonna do, put monument, stone monuments out there at the end of the driveway that fall into the ditch? Well, you, you know, have you guys seen those green, um, or the, re, the, the, the rebar sticks, right? The rebar steel with the number on it? Yeah. We have quite a bit of those. They're not pretty, but they work. They work. <laughs> you know, uh, another, hey Scott, another thought I've had about this is if we're uh, going with a system of cluster boxes, does it continue to make sense to assign addresses the way we usually do for the houses within that subdivision? Or do you just kind of go, maybe would you just instead have the addresses be lot numbers? Say you're in, I don't know, never mind, that doesn't make sense. Then the reason I thought of this is because we've got subdivisions where they're requesting all the addresses in advance because they're gonna create cluster boxes even before the houses are built. And they need to know what all the addresses are gonna be. And what we found is that they don't wanna put the whole street name on the cluster box. They just wanna put the number. So if you have five or six streets in the subdivision, you need to make sure in this kind of situation that you don't use the same number twice, even if they're on different streets. Like you can't have a 35, 3537 first street and 3537 uh, deer, deer, deer drive or whatever, because then you'd have two cluster boxes that just say 3537 on them. So it gets to be real, you know, just clunky because you've got a bunch of cluster boxes with a whole bunch of random, looks like a bunch of random numbers on them instead of any kind of sequence. <laughs> because they don't want to put the street names on them. Have you run into that, Sean? Or has Kevin run into that? Have you, have you uh, that? Not, not yet, 100%. Uh, we're fighting it as well. Uh, we, we do have, we've done instances like uh, for apartment buildings, you know, apartment building will have uh, an address and then you'll have suite for apartment 101, 102, 103, 104. And no, no building has the same address or the same apartment number. But I'm, I'm telling you, this, this cluster box is so uh, early right now. I, I'm not 100% on the countywide 
um, how we're going to work with this, we may just kick and scream <laughs> and, and just see what happens. And, um, but I haven't, we haven't run across one of those yet. Um, we're still developing a lot of subdivisions that had vacant lots. We, we had quite a few subdivisions that just were not complete. So a lot of, a lot of lots are being built now. So once we start getting new subdivisions, uh, it's probably gonna, it's probably gonna come across my desk. I'm seeing some of that out in East Tennessee. Yeah. Hey, hey Scott. Well, what I, I think what I was trying to get at, um, when I mentioned using something like lot numbers instead of the regular street addresses is in, maybe instead of addressing on the residential streets where the houses actually sit, if you're going to have cluster boxes at the entrance to the subdivision, maybe the all the houses in that subdivision use the same street address as based on the the uh, arterial road where the entrance to the subdivision is, and then you use just building numbers that correspond to the lot numbers. Does that make any sense? It does. That would be, be post office driven. Yeah, I've seen a lot of them like that, but the, it all depends on, and you could do that. I've seen it in, uh, in the Delta, in the Mississippi Delta, they do that a lot with, um, with these smaller subdivisions that maybe only have two or three rows. The lot numbers are actually the numbers and the cluster boxes are out front associated with it. That's mostly for like private roads and stuff like that. It wouldn't work for DeSoto County just simply because it would go completely against what our addressing authority states that we have to have for every new structure. Right, but that addressing authority doesn't can, doesn't take into consideration this situation with cluster boxes. I don't know. They're going to have to. So, I don't know. Just a thought. Well, does anybody else have anything? I know AJ will actually take the presentation and put it up um, and post it. So if you need it, or if you want me to send you a PDF, the whole thing, just shoot me an email and I got you. Um, yes, we'll, we'll uh, I'm not sure if AJ is actually here right now, but we're, we're just- I'm always here, Rob, I'm always here. <laughs> But so I'll, I'll just let AJ say, but I was just going to say, we are just like with the last presentation, AJ is recording it. He's going to turn this into a YouTube video, which we will then post on the magic website and blast out to y'all an email form with a link to it so that um, you can watch it again. Yeah. If y'all know of anybody doing something cool, working on something interesting or, um, you know, and it doesn't necessarily have to be pertained to, to just to GIS. Um, tell them to come on and these little, you know, half hour conversations, us just getting together. It's, it's really helping the people. I can tell you right now, it's really helping the people that aren't going into the office. Because imagine sitting in, you know, in a room all day long and not having anybody to talk to, especially, you know, fellow professionals. Especially, it's, it's good to see y'all's faces. Some, some of ours, not mine though. Uh, so Scott, if I can send you a link or either I can share screens, we put Sean's rub -a hub using Esri's hub platform to clean up your GIS presentation. It's 53 minutes long. That's up there. Um, I went through the whole process to be able to figure out how YouTube works because I'm not a YouTuber. I like to watch it. I'm not a, an uploader, but anyway, We'll get yours up there too, Scott. And two weeks from now, we have Brett Clark from NearMap and his team are gonna do a presentation on aerial imagery. Um, there's also um, the Esri user conference. We're gonna try and pull in as much of that content as we can and kind of tie you guys into that. So if you're not aware that the Esri user conference and that's normally in San Diego is live this year, please feel free to uh, try and help us gather for those get to get like Let's get together. Let's do some watch parties. Let's do something that helps us be engaged because I'm sick of 2020 and Corona personally. Yeah. Here, but, here. but bring your 10, bring your 10 foot pole and stay, stay 10 feet away from me. And especially 
a couple of people. Y'all gotta wear masks. I know you're dirty. I know you're dirty. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen your data, and if your data re represents you, you're dirty. <laughs> But go if you want to go to Magic Memphis and on YouTube, the link is there, or I can share screens or send you guys a link out with Rob or Scott or whatever. But we have Sean, we have Sean's presentation up there. If you, if you missed it, it's it's here, um, and I'll have Scott's up sometime over the next day or so. It takes a minute for them to authenticate that it's not an inappropriate video. And you guys talked about a lot of addressing, so Google might not know what to do with it. I mean, cluster boxes are going to mess up their, their algorithms. <laughs> but it's also nice to see some, uh, some friendly, some friendly names and faces, um, and hear the conversation. We miss being able to get together for sure. And also, I think maybe while we have a second, um, we decided this week that the November conference needs to be digital. So we're trying to figure that one out. Bear with us. Oh, oh boy. Yeah. yeah. So what I think our best idea right now is to run three or four days where it's like two or three hours sessions. And if you want to do a presentation, like maybe <clears throat> with your permission, Sean, we could take your video and be like, Hey, here's one of the presentations and run yours again. And then maybe have, um, it's already recorded. And if you want to make a re-edit of it or do something, we could take that again or some of the stuff Kev has done in the past or whoever, um, rerun some of like pre-record them so we can play them and then just talk about it afterwards. So do like a three hour session with, uh, a 30 minute video and then a 20 minute talk. That's our, that's our best idea right now. So, I don't know if that's our best idea, but that's hey, one we're of the ideas. Open for any ideas, please. We're, we're yeah, working on it. <laughs> we're, 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 one thing we're going to do next week is uh, check out what Esri's doing with the UC yes. to get some ideas of how, what a virtual conference should look like. So, we, we're not, we're not going to get too into the weeds on that today, but. Um, as AJ mentioned, we're batting around the idea of doing a, like a watch party somewhere where we actually get together in some. Or even encourage, or even encourage people to get together. Like to an get, outdoor garden with some big screen TVs. Or, or uh, encourage you to get to, together in your own capacity. So like if you're, you know, if you live in Tipton County, then maybe somebody that lives near you can get over that way. You know, a small so, group. Anyway, um, I think uh, we, we've uh, taken up more time than we intended to uh, of your day today. So um, thank you again, Scott, for um, sharing all your knowledge with us. And um, as uh, AJ mentioned, we've got another webinar coming up on, in two weeks on Tuesday, June, July 14th. There'll be a, uh, announcements coming out about that. And so just uh, keep just keep on, keep it on, and uh, look for look for information uh, that we'll be sending out. I'm just disappointed that we didn't get to ride the fire truck. I see a smudge on the window, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Captain. Yep. Thanks, Scott. Good to see everybody. All right. Thanks, y'all. Bye. Bye.